Welcome inside the RX Muscle Studios here in New York for another episode of Ask Dave, better known as hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. Glad you can join us on this Wednesday, the 18th day of May in the year 2016. This is a 30 minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation the IFBB uh, competitions, pros. We have the New York Pro coming up uh, this weekend in uh, New Jersey. So a lot to talk about and a lot to ask. So with that, we bring in Dave Palumbo. Dave, of course, the New York Pro coming up. But before that, a special episode, special preview episode of the Heavy Muscle TV show. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of people in studio. I'm not even sure exactly who's going to be here, but I do know that Thomas and Andrea Lenahan will be here. Tom Lenahan making his uh, pro debut. Uh, he's looking spectacular under the guidance of Chris Aceto. Chris Aceto will be in the studio as well. He's mm-hmm. going to be coming staying with us for the weekend. Looking forward to having Chris uh, down here, of course. And uh, we will have uh, Nathan DeAsher from the UK by way of Kuwait, part of the Camel Crew now over there. And he's going to be wowing a lot of people. And, of course, our species nutrition elite athlete, Brian Yursky, will be in the studios. And we don't know who else will show up. You never know. Uh, so, guys, you'll stay tuned. That'll be Thursday. That'll be live on Thursday night, probably around 7 or 8 o'clock. We haven't decided exact time. And uh, I'm excited about New York Pro. I'll tell you why. Because it's in our backyard. Uh, I love the venue that, that Steve Weinberger holds it in now uh, in Jersey, in Teaneck, New Jersey. It's in the Marriott there. It's so easy to get to. The parking is good. The food is great around there. I can't wait to go see that show. It's really the first show I've been to in, uh, since the Arnold. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And it's a, and it's a stellar lineup. we got Dexter Jackson going to be in the show. Juan Morrell. <coughs> Max Charles. Da- John De La Rosa, Nathan DeAsher, I mentioned before. And who knows who else is going to show up. Uh, I don't even know if the list has been officially announced, but it's going to be a great lineup. You're not going to want to miss this. All the coverage will be on RX Muscle, including uh, contest photos, wrap-up videos, uh, winner interviews, the whole kit and caboodle, everything we're doing there. We're going to spend the whole day there. So, guys, uh, it's going to be an exciting weekend. If you want to ask a question on this show, you can join us on the Muscle Central Forum on rxmuscle.com. If you're not already a member, it is free to register. You can join us live on YouTube. If you're watching us live on the YouTube page, you can ask your questions uh, in the chat box on the right-hand side of the video screen. And if you're watching us for the first time, we ask that you subscribe, hitting the button below. That way you're not going to miss any of our shows, any of our segments, any of our updates, or as this weekend comes about, any of our contest coverage. Or you could join us on our social media channels on Instagram, official underscore RX Muscle, our official Facebook page, or you can tweet your questions using hashtag AskDave. We first go to Tim Perry. Dave, the Olympia contracts are meant to be in, and so I guess uh, this is uh, a holdover question from last week, so we'll still ask it because the the ramifications are still playing out with this. Um, Do you think the IFBB will extend in favor of Kai uh, being the, I guess, I don't know what he's trying to say, winging child that he has now become? I don't know if you meant winning or... I, I guess really what he means to ask is, uh, now that Kai is sort of a public darling back in the bodybuilding world, do you think the IFBB will extend him any favors here? I don't think anyone gets any favors extended to them on the Mr. Olympia stage, except maybe Mr. Olympia, because, you know, the old saying is you got to knock out the champion. So they always give you a little extra leeway uh, as Mr. Olympia uh, to not have to be maybe necessarily your absolute best sometimes. But you know what? They can only judge what's up on that stage. And last year, you know, no one was spectacular. Uh, I thought that uh, Roden was pretty amazing at prejudging, and I I had him clearly winning that. Uh, Dexter's always great, but, you know, Dexter's the kind of guy that doesn't stand out unless everyone else is a little off, which is what the case was. And that's why he plays so high. So I think that if Kai shows up at his best, he's going to do well. To be honest with you, I don't think Kai is his best he's ever been. I think that, you know, his his glory years of the 09 you know, 2010, when he was at his best, are long gone. That's six years ago at this point. And we're not going to see that Kai Green anymore. But he's so good that he's still good enough to win the Olympia. Uh, it's a matter of whether he shows up at his best, fills a little off. You know, uh, Lavroni doesn't look as good as we all are, uh, in, you know, hoping he looks. And, uh, you know, the stars are shining on him. So 
once again, you got to be in it, though, to win it. Last year he wasn't in it, so he couldn't win it. And that might have been the year that he would have won it. So uh, if Kai shows up, I think he will get a share shake. I don't think anyone's going to give him any favors, however. Yeah. Let's go to, I believe it's Mateo Sosa. Dave, I'm a natural bodybuilder. I train every body part once a week. All my body respond, but my arms are still the same after a long time. What's the problem? Do you have any tips? I've uh, I've mentioned this tip before. I, I have a long arm. And as, you know, coming up as a bodybuilder, I was packing on a me- tremendous amounts of size. And my arms never were really up to stuff. I, you know, my dad used to say to me, yeah, you don't have the arms of these other guys. Like, that, that's like my, my dad, when he sees bodybuilding, he has no idea about anything, but he knows arms. And you know what? It bothered me that I didn't have the big arms. And so I, uh, I had a conversation with Vince Taylor once about, you know, training arms. And he had enormous arms. I figured they were just genetic freaks, you know. Uh, and he said to me, you know, Dave, I do all cable work for arms, and I do isolation work, and uh, but I train them heavy, you know. And I said, yeah, I'm going to try that. So I started doing all cable work, one arm at a time, but I built up to heavy weight. And what I found that was when I was using cables, I felt the muscles working rather than every other muscle. When I would do straight barbell curls, I would feel everything but my arms working. I would feel my back. I would feel my forearms, and I was swinging my body. And I wasn't getting a good arm work out of it. But when I use cables, you really can't cheat. And as long as you keep your wrist down and you don't use your, your forearms, you, you really can't cheat with for biceps and triceps. You certainly can't cheat. So uh, when I started doing those workouts once a week, and I actually split my arms. I did biceps and forearms on one day. I did triceps on their own day. So I did an eight-day split, actually. Uh, my arms started growing all of a sudden. And I said, holy mackerel. There's something to this, and I and I and it took. It was very difficult for me because I was a heavy lifter to put my ego aside and say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about the guys that are doing 225 on the on the barbell curls. I'm going to abandon those. I'm not going to even do those exercises. I'm just going to do cable exercises, and I'll tell you what, it worked. And to this day, I still advocate it for people with long arms. You're watching Ask Dave on RSMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition. We go to. Mr. C. Shadows, Dave, I hate this show as much as George Farah hates wearing shirts that actually fit him normally. <laughs> well, last week, uh, Sadiq Hadzovic posted that he got the contract invite for Classic Physique Olympia. Why is he automatically doing it and not earning it with a win like the rest of the field? I understand Lavroni being invited, but I don't think it's fair for Sadiq to just compete without earning it. Like, And then he mentions... First names, Darum, Danny, Stan, and the last winner, I'm guessing you meant Arash or Bar uh, for the Pittsburgh Pro. Uh, he wants to know your take on that. Well, you know, to say Sadiq hasn't earned a spot on the Olympia stage is, is really not being fair to him. The guy won the Arnold Classic in, in men's physique. He was second at the Olympia. Uh, the guy has earned his stripes in the physique division, you know. Given the fact that this is the first classic physique Olympia, I think that they can throw him a bone and give him a special invite for the first uh, Olympia. They give, they've give, they used to give special invites every single year to the Mr. Olympia contest. I remember Paul DeMeo got one one year. Uh, there was, oh, Lou Ferrigno got one. So I'm not saying that Sadiq's up there in, the, in that classification, but he has earned his stripes in the sense that he's competed a lot. He's won a ton of shows. The classic physique division is a natural extension of men's physique. I think it's fine. Now, if he doesn't do well at the classic physique Olympia, to invite him back the next year is, is a mistake, obviously. But um, I, I can see where he's coming from. I, I would think that he would want to get a warm-up, though. You know, I'm, I, I still think we might see Sadiq at Tampa Pro. Don't count him out because I think he might want to get on stage and test, his, uh, you know, test out how he looks in that division rather than test it out on the Olympia stage because that's not the right stage to be testing out is your protocols and is the, the methodologies that you're using going to work 100%. Let's go to fitness training motivation. Dave, what is a good pre-workout meal to have before a workout as you're real close to a bodybuilding contest? Well, when I'm pre-contest dieting, Whatever the meat next meal is in my plan, that's what I that's what I eat pre contest. You know, all my meals are kind of, kind of similar. So if I'm eating chicken with cashew nuts or chicken with cashew nuts and maybe some rice, you know, as most as most of my meals, that's going to be the meal I'm going to eat an hour before I go to the gym. You know, that's just the way it goes. You know, if it happens to be an egg meal, I might have uh, 
five whole eggs, you know, uh, before I go to the gym. If I'm having some carbs at that point, I might have five whole eggs with a little bit of oatmeal. Uh, if it happens to be my my red meat meal or salmon meal, I'll have my salmon and and, and, and meal. So I don't, and I always tell this to people. Same thing with post a workout. Um, there's no such thing as like a post-workout meal really when you're dieting because all the meals are kind of equal anyway. Now sometimes when I start guys out on contest diets, I do have a post-workout shake that I will incorporate it for, for a little period of time where they're doing a waxy, a waxy you know, high molecular weight carbohydrate with a whey protein isolate. Um, but once that's eliminated, it doesn't really matter what meal you're doing at that point. Because once again, the goal is not to build muscle. The goal is to burn fat and preserve your muscle. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people try, and, and I hear this all the time. Oh, I got weak arms, uh, or I got weak legs. I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a high carb day on my leg day, or I'm gonna have a high carb day on my arm day. You know, most of the time that just sabotages your diet. You're not putting on muscle, and you're not losing muscle as long as you're taking in enough protein. Let's go to Manchester Arcade. <clears throat> Why do older bodybuilder legs always fade away in comparison to their upper body? Um, I guess he's trying to say that he can see something similar happening to Kevin Lavroni. I think Kevin's problem is he just didn't really train his legs that much to the end of his career. You know, but when he retired, he was kind of getting lazy. Uh, but yeah, you know what I think happens? I think as we get older, the the spine starts to compress more. I think the space between the vertebrae compress more. The nerves don't fire as well. Um, I think our flexibility decreases a little bit, and I think the, the the muscles just don't you know work as well. You know things get get tired. You know the good thing about like a guy like Dexter Jackson is he's not that big to begin with. So and he never really had huge legs, so you don't really see that much of a difference. But and then the guys that had humongous legs, they can tend to they tend to fare better into their older age as well because they have more mass. Even if they lose a little mass, they still got big legs. I mean, Cutler's legs towards the end of his career were not as big as early on in his career. Same with Branch Warren. But they had so much leg mass that you didn't notice it. Uh, so, I, And the funny thing is, with women, you don't see that. The women, their legs sometimes get better when they get bigger, uh, when they get older. Probably because they have less estrogen. So, uh, you know, I think taking a beating in your body over the years definitely you know hurts and that's usually you see it in the legs. But Lavroni took off a lot of time in his day. He never trained year-round. So I think his legs will be good, and they'll be fresh. Let's go to Tudor Roman. Greetings from Romania. Awesome show. Uh, Dave, can you please explain why a lot of people always say you don't have a good workout if you don't have the next day delayed onset muscle soreness? Well, that's actually a misnomer because delayed muscle on, uh, uh, excuse me, delayed muscle soreness is really an indicator that you're not recovering properly, okay? So once you get into a routine of getting used to training, okay, you might be a little sore after the workout, but by the next day you should start feeling good. If you're getting delayed muscle soreness two days later, that means you're either overtraining or you're not eating you know, properly to recover from the workout. Um, so uh, most of the time you see it in guys that just overtrain themselves to death, you know. Uh, because I very rarely ever had like tremendously sore body parts after training because my body just got used to it. Now, after leg day, I would get that, you know, nauseous feeling and you know, make it, uh, I was almost a little irritable because when you train legs really heavy, it traumatizes your nervous system a little bit. I'm sure you guys have experienced this. You had a tough leg workout. You go home and you, you feel crappy. You almost can't sit on the couch. You're like antsy. That's because your nervous system is is, is over overstimulated. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you get enough sleep and enough rest. The best way to, to recover the nervous system, believe it or not, is, is, is sleeping at night. So if you're not sleeping enough, that's definitely going to help you hurt your recovery. One of the things I did when I was back competing was I would not only try to sleep in eight, nine hours at night, I would come home after workouts. I would eat a meal or drink a shake, and I would take a nap for 45 minutes. When I got up, I felt like I was already recovered. It was great. Um, and that really, you know, luckily I had the luxury, the lifestyle luxury of doing that. I didn't have a lot of responsibility. I wasn't working a full-time job. I had a sponsorship for metrics. I was doing guest posings and stuff like that. So um, that's the best way to grow, believe it or not. Let's go to Sanad Humidi. Uh, Dave, what was your ab workout back in the day? And let's go with that, and then we'll go to part two of the question. I, I always trained abs. I was a big believer in ab training, and um, I, I, I always did crunches with my legs up on a bench because I think that limited range of motion really isolates the upper abs. And I would do, I would do like you know two sets of like 50 to 60 reps, and then I would do leg lifts for my lower abs, and I would do 
no more than six inches off the ground, I'd lift my legs. You know, just this movement, very slow, but really controlled, holding the abs in. And I would do, and I and I do the same workout to this day. And I would do 50 to 60 reps with that. And then I would do some, a little bit of side crunches, but I wouldn't get on my side and do it. I would do it from the front. I would do a little slight twist just to work the obliques. Uh, you know, you don't want to work them too much because then obviously you're going to thicken them. So, and I was very heavy. So think, imagine doing a crunch at 315 pounds. That's a lot of weight you're lifting up. That's the routine I use then. It's the same routine I use now. Uh, I, I'm a lot lighter now, obviously, so I can, I can do some more reps. But uh, I felt that that worked. I would do that two to three. I would probably do that three to four times a week, believe it or not. And I felt that that was plenty, and it gave me abdominal control that, that I desperately needed on stage. <laughs> Let's go to KC89UK. Dave, are digestive enzymes essential? What time of day and what quantity do you recommend? I, I'm not a big – I've tried the digestive enzyme route. You know, you take them – like 20 minutes before a meal on an empty stomach with water, and then you eat your meal. I, I don't think they do anything. To be honest with you, unless you're eating an exorbitant amount of food, you probably produce more than enough uh, digestive enzymes in your system already to break down the food. Um, I, I just don't think they're, like I said, I don't think they're a necessity. Um, but some people, you know, do like them. I found that when I took, like, especially if I took, if I took like hydrochloric acid secretors, like the, which like cayenne pepper and stuff like that, I got a lot of indigestion from that, which implied to me that I already had enough acid production in my stomach. So, like I said, there's not many people that are digested enzyme deficient. There might be a small population of people out there who are, but most aren't. So, once again, it's one of those supplements I don't think I would waste my money on. Let's go to Redmond Ross. Insulin use pre or post or post workout. Sid, so you know that I've I've <laughs> we've had had long diatribes and uh, rants on this. You know what does insulin do? It takes blood glucose or sugar in your blood, carbs, and forces it into the muscles. And if the muscles are full, it puts it into the fat cells. It basically lowers blood sugar. Why would you want to lower blood sugar before you go to the gym to train? <laughs> Especially since you're using blood sugar in the gym. So here you got. Something that's drawing blood sugar out of the uh, sugar out of the blood, the workout, and then you got another, you got a hormone, and then that's driving sugar out of the blood into the muscle cells. Okay, you're gonna get low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, and you're, you're gonna feel like you're gonna pass out, you're gonna feel terrible. Taking insulin before you go to the gym is ridiculous because all the the car glycogen that you're using inside the muscle, okay, for the workout is is already there. It's been stored from the, the day before you, all the meals you ate and the day before that. So. What you want to do is, if you're going to take insulin, you want to take it post workout when you're not, you know, when you want to draw calories into the muscle cells to replace what you just depleted. Uh, so I, I, you know, look, I know guys do it; they think they're going to get a better pump. You know, what it what it does is it makes you a little bloated. So uh, I think what the people are feeling is more of the water bloat from the insulin. But you can get that from taking it in the morning when you wake up as well. So I think it's a big mistake to take <coughs> insulin pre workout. I like to you know, recommend people take it in the morning and then maybe post-workout or, or somewhere during the middle of the day. Let's go to Jewel. Uh, I, I can't pronounce this name. D. Gekarel. I hate this show so much that my eyes actually burn when I watch it. Dave, during keto, as a natural lifter, do you think it's a good idea to hit the big muscle groups the first days after the cheap meal since you have some gas in the tank <laughs> from all the carbs you ate, or do you think it doesn't matter? You know, we talked about this earlier, and, you know, um, my answer is going to change a little bit, obviously, because when you're on a ketogenic diet that's very low carb, your glycogen stores are low. Um, now, if you want to structure the cheat meal around a body part that might be weaker so that you have a little more glycogen in the muscle, then that's fine. Now, I certainly don't think it's necessary for smaller groups. I'm talking like back or legs. Like, when I would want to, you know, training legs is really, really draining and it does dr probably use more glycogen than most body parts do same thing with back especially if you're deadlifting on back day you might want to do the cheat meal before those days the problem with doing the cheat meal the day before a uh, a big workout is that when you wake up in the morning after the cheat meal you're not really kind of in ketosis yet and you kind of feel a little groggy so it's hard to get started in the gym You'll probably have a good workout once you get going, but it is a little harder to get started. So a lot sometimes people might want to do it two days after the cheat meal, the big body part. Let's go to building my masterpiece or building underscore my underscore masterpiece. 
Hey, Dave, do you think it's possible to, for a men's physique guy uh, to become an IFBB pro naturally? I, I believe so. Probably of all the men's divisions, that would be the division you could probably do it in. Although they tend to be going for bigger guys nowadays. But if you have a good structure, small waist, broad shoulders, and you could put, and you got a little bit of muscle, it might take a little longer to pack on the muscle. I, I think it can certainly be done. Um, once again, most people are lazy and they want to take the shortcuts. And obviously the, the anabolics make it a lot easier to get there faster. But I, I think it could be done. Let's go to... To Rock P. Hey, Dave, I hate this show so much that I would rather watch Kai Green replace Bob Ross as the new TV painting instructor. <laughs> He'd probably do it, too, with all those happy little trees. You remember that, right? Of course. <laughs> do you have any knowledge with people that are legitimately diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder using anabolic steroids? Are there any potential side effects that you would be aware of? Unfortunately, I have a, a lot of experience with that because for some reason, yeah, all those people always contact me. Uh, and, uh, you know, OCD, it, 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 I feel bad for a lot of the guys that have it because it, it is, it, it's a real obstacle in a person's life. And, and, but there are some good medications out there that definitely alleviate the symptoms. Um, usually the OCD guys are really good bodybuilders because they're very you know, structured in the way they, they, they have their diet and their workouts. Um, you know. Anabolic shouldn't make it worse, but I do. I could definitely see in some people that it might make it worse. Um, but it, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know from a, a biochemistry standpoint, the medications that are taken for OCD do not interfere with anabolic steroids. So if that's the question, you're good. Uh, will the the uh, the brain be affected by the anabolic steroids? Probably the ones with really high androgens might make it a little more. Uh, intensified, so you might want to stay away from like the trembolones and the halitestins and the anadrols uh, and stick to more of the anabolic compounds. Let's go to Ilyaz.ali. I have had L4, I believe it's L4, L5, S1 fusion, which created a lot of scar tissue in the healing. I have trouble with chronic pain. Is there anything I can take as a supplement to help? Well, I mean, I certainly would recommend a high glucosamine, high MSM. Uh, joint uh, repair and uh, replacement product, something like Arthralyze, you know, five pills twice a day, definitely would help uh, with the inflammation, with the recovery of that area. Uh, and obviously, every time you work out, you're breaking it down a little bit, so you want to make sure you are rebuilding it. Um, I, you know, I go to a doctor who did uh, stem cells in my shoulders, but by the way, a lot of people have been asking me for updates on that. They are recovering, and my shoulders are start, starting to feel a little better. It's going to take six months. Well, the doctor who did him, he does what's called facet injections. They inject the individual vertebral processes with, you know, some kind of like a, like a cortisone type of uh, mixture uh, to alleviate pain. That might be something you're, you, you, you want to do because I'm not a big advocate of cortisone injections, but when they place it specifically in one little place, it could give you big relief. So you might want to look into that type of a therapeutic. Uh, but from as far as from a repair standpoint, definitely want to take a product like Arthralyze. No doubt. Let's go to GGov Johnny. I hate this show so much because Dave is always talking about his fiber supplements so much. Ha ha, LOL. Hey, Dave, I removed my tonsils a week ago, and my doctor recommended me to not train for three weeks, but I feel completely fine, and I did a workout today, and it was great. Any risk for training instead of resting? No, I think if you feel good and you, and you you know the throat's not bleeding anymore or anything like that, I, I don't think tonsillectomy is really such a huge freaking operation that you really have to worry about anything. It's not an internal incision or anything like that. Uh, it's like I said, as long as it's not oozing or, or still bleeding in your throat, I think you're fine. Let's go to uh, got a couple of long questions here. Uh, let's go to Evil Live Forty Three, which are two words flipped back and forth. I hate this show because you never answer my question. We're going to ask you a question. But seriously, love your show. Thank you. Your opinions on Androgel. I'm a 40-year-old male who's been prescribed this as a TRT alternative. Uh, are these a waste or should I just do injections? Well, Androgel works, but you got to put the stuff on every freaking day. And it's a cream and it can't touch your wife or your kids. Uh, you know, it, it has to dry. It's just a pain in the ass, to be honest with you. But it does work. Um, 
Personally, I'd prefer to do one injection per week, you know, one shot a week. It's a lot easier. You know it's all getting in 100% because you're injecting it into yourself. You don't have to worry about it rubbing off on anything or, or you don't have to remember, oh, I forgot to do it. Um, injections are much easier. Uh, BB78, Dave, what does Benadryl exactly do while you're on Clen? Do they help clean receptors for Clen on a two-week uh, on two-week off cycle or should Clen stay on the entire time? I was never a big advocate or a big believer <coughs> in antihistamine use for helping to restore clenbuterol re or beta-2 receptors. Um, all I found that, 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 that um, antihistamines did, like Benadryl, was make you tired. And quite frankly, who the hell wants to be tired all the time? So I haven't seen any benefit of taking them. Um, I'm an advocate of taking clenbuterol every single day. I don't like the two-week on, two-week off protocol because in the two weeks off, you lose all the, the, the uh, benefits or all the fat loss that you had in the two weeks while you're on. So it's like you're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I like to stay on it continuously, augment the dose every couple weeks, and, and get the benefits that way. I don't think that these antihistamines do anything, like I said, but make you tired. I would just stay away from them. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com this upcoming weekend. Full coverage of the 2016 New York Pro. And, of course, uh, later this week we're going to have a special preview edition of the New York Pro. We're going to bring back Heavy Muscle TV, so you're not going to want to miss that. Keep it locked to RxMuscle.com for dates and times. Let's go to Marlon Taylor. Why does prolactin make you emotional? What is the science behind that? Well, you got to remember, what is pro what, when does the body release prolactin? Let's let's think about it. This, in the female body, the body she the, the woman releases prolactin uh, after the woman gives birth to, to release um, uh, milk from the uh, mammary glands, and it, they call it the bonding or love hormone in a sense because it helps the mother bond with the feed or the, the the baby that's just been born, the newborn. So of course it makes you emotional. In the male, okay. When does the body release? When does the male release prolactin? Well, after a male has an orgasm, okay, uh, they release prolactin, and that causes the uh, refractory period. That's why you really you can't have sex again immediately after you you just had sex. It's pretty hard because of that prolactin surge, okay. And that's meant to have bonding time or give you bonding time with the the, the person you're having sex with, supposedly, you know, evolutionarily speaking. So uh, of course, if you have high prolactin from taking a drug like Trembolone or or Deca. You're going to have that. Some people get emotion, emotional on the stuff. Some guys, most guys, a lot of guys, too many guys probably lose their sex drive. Never happened to me, but uh, a lot of guys lose their sex drive. It suppresses their sex drive or their ability to get an erection. And uh, it, that's all predictable behavior. Now, a lot of guys will take Dostinex or Cabergamine, uh, which is the uh, generic name of it, uh, to block that uh, uh, prolactin production. Uh, but it doesn't always work in everyone. Um, so... For guys that have are, are very severely affected by it, I recommend you just don't take DECA or Trembolone. Usually it's the DECA that's worse than the Trembolone, but it can be both. Time for one more question. We go to Steve Buccilli. I hate this show so much. I would rather see Jason Genova get a special invite to the Olympia instead of Kevin Lavroni. <laughs> Dave is, is adding fiber to a whey isolate, and then he puts in parentheses, isolize. Slow down absorption, is it a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, the fiber will definitely slow down the absorption a little bit. Not, not severely. Not, not as slow. It won't slow it as much as putting a fat source in there will. But, um, you know, obviously I make the fiberlized a lot. Of, some guys mix the fiberlized with their isolized whey protein. To me, it really makes it too thick almost. It's almost very hard to consume. Um, if you like it. Do it. It's not going to. It's not going to negatively do anything to it. If anything, it might enhance the fact that that, that the whey isolate might not get absorbed too quickly. But uh, it, it does make the shake very, very thick. To me, the best way to consume a fiber supplement, especially fiberlized, is put it in about four to six ounces of water. Put the scoop in, stir it, and before you even get that spoon out of there, guzzle it right down. I do it like a like a vodka shot almost, and then I chase it down with some more water so it doesn't get caught in my throat. But that's the easiest way to do it. The, the longer you leave the fiber lies there with the water in it, the more fluid it absorbs and it becomes like a gelatinous mass almost. Now, some people like that. They eat it like jello almost. And that's fine. You can do that if you want. But uh, I like to just guzzle it down as quickly as possible. 
And just also, I just want to add one more note that if anyone wants to uh, sign up for the Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru class, I believe we have four spots left. So uh, you can go to DavePalumbo.com. That's my 10-hour class that I offer on June 18th, Saturday, June 18th. Uh, it's 10 hours of how to become a diet guru, diet, supplements, drug use, men, women, off-season, pre-contest, site injection oils, detoxification. I talk about it all. Uh, you can go on DavePalumba.com and sign up. I advise you do it because we're, we're, we're getting closer and closer to that event, and we're going to run out of spots, and you're going to have to wait till the next course, which I don't even know when it's going to be. It could be in July or August. I'm not sure. Probably August. So um, you guys sign up for that. Also, anyone wanting to get a, a copy of my uh, detox program, my three-week cleansing detox program, I offer it for free. You can email me at huge285 at AOL.com, and I will send you a copy for nothing. Uh, I want to make sure everyone out there is healthy and detoxed. And and that's uh, that's what we got going on. Uh, I'm looking forward to the New York Pro this weekend. So the New York Pro, full coverage of the New York Pro this weekend, and of course, Heavy Muscle TV. Keep it locked to rxmuscle.com for full details of all broadcasts. We may have some more live wits in studio coming up over the next couple of days as well. For Johnny Styles and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We will see you this Saturday from New Jersey at the New York Pro.